thanks for joining me this evening. This is uh, uh, one way for Tower Hill to continue con to connect with people um, is by uh, using you know modern technology. We've been having a lot of Zoom meetings, and uh, this was the the first sort of um, uh, I guess, organized and scheduled Zoom uh, lecture. Uh, so really looking forward to sharing with you this evening um, all about restoring the Frank L. Harrington Senior Apple Orchard at Tower Hill. Um, so this is a shot from quite a few years ago. This is the apple orchard looking toward the uh, secret garden. You can see the lawn garden pergola there in the background. Um, you can see a car there off to the left uh, if you're looking closely enough. Um, right adjacent to the parking lot. The apple orchard is a, is a, you know, a, a crown jewel. It's a prime piece of the experience at Tower Hill. It's also a really important component of our commitment to restoring, or not restoring, but uh, preserving um, a real significant and important piece of uh, our cultural heritage. Uh, these are heirloom apple varieties. So this is a collection that's got a really rich history. Um, some of the apple varieties have been uh, in cultivation for uh, hundreds of years, and we're really happy to be able to steward this collection into the future. Um, and occasionally you have to do something that makes you a little bit nervous when you have a, an apple collection like this one. Um, so we're in the process of restoring it. And that uh, thing that's made us all nervous is that all these trees are gone. Um, I realize many of you haven't been able to visit Tower Hill lately. Um, so if you haven't been to Tower Hill lately, uh, we, we took all the trees out last November. Um, and I'll discuss why we've done that, uh, why it's important, and, uh, and just the excitement that we have with uh, restoring this orchard. Let me see if I can get my PowerPoint to cooperate. Here we go. Um, so the, the orchard, there are a couple of important names associated with our orchard. Um, I mentioned it's the Frank L. Harrington uh, Orchard. Uh, the Harrington family uh, um, dedicated the orchard in, in honor of their late father, uh, Mr. Harrington. Um, so the orchard is named in his honor, but we call it the Davenport Collection. Um, and this is Sterney Davenport or Stearns Lothrop Davenport here in a, um, classic Yankee Magazine uh, article from 1971. Uh, Mr. Davenport was a gentleman farmer um, for the majority of his life. Uh, he had a, a pretty sizable collection of um, apples. And really the, the apple collection that we have, the varieties that we have are, are sort of a story of, of this man's commitment and this man's interest in uh, preserving this piece of our cultural heritage. Um, the, the, uh, the image that you see here from Yankee Magazine was from 1971. Um, this was near the end of, um, of Mr. Davenport's life. He uh, was considered a real expert um, in the heirloom apple varieties. His personal collection was about 60 varieties deep. Um, and he had been working on this for uh, the majority of his lifetime. Um, Mr. Harrington, or sorry, Mr. Davenport, um, during the Great Depression, led a, a WPA project uh, aimed at removing old, diseased, um, uh, unmanaged apples from around commercial orchards. Uh, this was an effort to get people to work. Um, we, can, we can certainly appreciate uh, the importance of that during the time period that we're in right now. Um, this was also an effort to, uh, to help the commercial uh, apple industry control insect and disease on their, on their trees um, by removing unmanaged trees from around those orchards. He was, uh, he was helping to uh, eliminate a source of, of insects, a source of pathogens um, that might impact those commercial orchards. Um, and it was also a way to give people some, some firewood to heat their homes. Um, and in leading that project, which was a very important project, he realized that he was in some ways maybe cutting down the last of a, of a variety of apple that would be found no place else. There were a lot of apples um, that were developed when, uh, when Americans uh, really started uh, or landed here um, in this country. Apples uh, were developed over generations. Uh, a lot of times there were, um, you know, sports or, uh, or, or breeding work um, that was done to try to create new varieties. Um, so there's a lot of diversity in the apple genome. There's a lot of diversity uh, in the apple varieties that, um, 
that we've had historically in this country. And unfortunately, um, the apple varieties that we have now in the grocery stores are limited to just a, a handful uh, of varieties. And, and for the most part, those are varieties that um, ship well, store well, look good, and are, are pest and disease resistant. Um, so we're really lacking uh, a lot of flavor, a lot of color, um, and a lot of interest. Uh, there's, there's a lot more out there. And, and Mr. Davenport recognized this even in the 30s and 40s. Um, this is an excerpt from a report that was written by his daughter. Um, and, and I think it tells a nice uh, historical story. So I, I just figured I'd read a, f a few parts of it. Um, he was, she was obviously quite proud of her dad and the work that he, has done, he had done. Um, so it starts out with his name was Stearns Lothrop Davenport. Um, he's sometimes been called a modern, Johnny, uh, modern day Johnny Appleseed. Um, started in 1930, where he had the idea of bringing back old varieties of apples when he had charge of that work, uh, that WPA project that I mentioned before, um, cutting them up for firewood. He felt these old, old varieties uh, were parts of nostalgia that were going to be lost forever. Um, and this is really a story of a, a, a partnership between Mr. Davenport and the Worcester County Horticultural Society. Uh, the Worcester County Horticultural Society is the organization that owns and operates Tower Hill Botanic Garden. Um, we're quite old. Uh, we're, we're uh, you know, well into our uh, second century, uh, nearing the end of our second century, in fact. Um, we've been around for a long time, uh, and in 1951, Mr. Davenport approached the Worcester County Hort Society decades before Tower Hill was even a vision um, to, uh, to find out if the, if the Hort Society would be interested in uh, partnering him uh, with him on this effort to uh, preserve heirloom varieties of apples. Um, and Myron Converse, who was president of the Worcester County Hort Society at the time, um, uh, agreed that this would be a fantastic project for the Worcester County Hort Society to get involved with. Um, and so they uh, worked together to uh, collect apple varieties, bring them back to uh, Mr. Davenport's home farm in, in, uh, in South Grafton, Massachusetts, um, and then to uh, embark on an effort to distribute scion wood. Now you'll hear that term scion wood quite a bit through this presentation. Um, scions are essentially propagules of apples. So apples don't come true to seed. If you try to grow a seed of a Macintosh, for example, you won't get a Macintosh. Um, you'd get something that may have some properties of Macintosh, but might also have properties of other apples uh, that were involved in pollinating that, uh, that ovary that became, um, became that seed. And uh, so it's important that you, in order to preserve or appreciate uh, a particular variety of apple, um, you have to propagate it in a, in a format that we call asexual propagation. And I'll show you a great video on uh, how we do that with apples a little bit later on in the presentation. Uh, but the idea was to collect as many of these old uh, varieties as, as they could, and then to distribute scion wood, so cuttings basically, um, from those trees so that other people could appreciate, uh, other people could grow these apples, whether they're in commercial orchards or, uh, or just backyard orchards. Um, this is a great way to distribute the scion wood to essentially create a large pool uh, of preserved varieties of apples. Um, in 1967, the farm uh, was sold to a commercial grower uh, who wasn't interested in preserving this, uh, this heirloom orchard. And so they really had to find a new home. And so it's pretty interesting that that Yankee Magazine article was written in 1971. Um, and it talks about the effort to find a new home for, uh, for the apple orchard. Tower Hill was, uh, was started as a garden uh, in the mid 1980s. Um, so in uh, around 1970 or so, 67, 70, um, there really was no site that Worcester County Horticultural Society could, uh, could find to bring the apple orchard. Um, so they reached out to Old Sturbridge Village and Old Sturbridge Village agreed to take on the, uh, the orchard. So the Worcester County, Hort, this is confusing, but the Worcester County Hort Society owned the orchard. Um, it was housed at Old Sturbridge Village, uh, which stewarded it for a long time. And in fact, they're still, uh, they still have pieces of that collection on the grounds today. Um, and then uh, eventually when Tower Hill became uh, an entity, uh, the organization was able to move 
those apple varieties uh, into this brand new garden. Um, so here's an aerial view of Tower Hill Botanic Garden from 1992. Um, those of you who are familiar with the garden can see the farmhouse here. Um, the farmhouse uh, dates back into the 18th century. Um, there's the lawn garden, newly planted. Uh, you can see a lot of the trees and shrubs are quite young, um, but you can see all the brick paths that lie in the lawn garden. Uh, and if you look closely, what you can see down in the uh, lower half of the, of the image is the newly planted apple orchard. Um, this was one of the very first projects that Worcester County Horticultural Society took on uh, when they started building Tower Hill out, um, was to move what had become 119 varieties of heirloom apple uh, apples to the garden um, to be celebrated, uh, but also to be stewarded for future generations. And so by 1992, the apple orchard had been fully planted. Um, here's another shot of it just a couple of years later, and you can see off in the distance, the, uh, the Stoddard Center, uh, that's actually the gift shop on the other side of those windows, um, the lawn garden pergola, which you saw in that initial uh, image that I had in the first slide of the presentation. Um, and so in, by 1994, the apples were doing quite well. Um, it was actually a, a volunteer uh, for Worcester County Horticultural Society who did every single graft um, to bring the, to, to propagate these trees and bring them here. Um, so we've had the apple orchard obviously at Tower Hill for just about 30 years. Um, we had, as I mentioned before, 119 different varieties. And for many, many, many years, uh, we participated or we, we administered uh, what we called the Scion Wood or the Scion Distribution Program. Um, so if you were so inclined, you could reach out to Tower Hill, get a brochure, uh, an order form like the one that you see in the, in the, in the screenshot here, um, and you could choose which apple varieties you were interested in. Um, you could order them. We would, uh, every uh, late winter, early spring, we would sell out or we would sell uh, scion wood by um, pre-order. Um, you can see here we sold them for the, the uh, grand price of $3 a piece. Um, uh, there's a minimum order of four, four sticks. Um, so for the, for the price of $12, you could have four pieces of scion wood from some of these really old uh, and, and rare and exceptional uh, varieties of apples to grow in your, in your home garden. Um, in, uh, in, in uh, many years, we would distribute uh, hundreds and hundreds of pieces of scion wood. Uh, we distributed to all 50 states, uh, a handful of other countries. Uh, lots of distributions went up to Canada, but uh, we distributed scion wood as far as Japan. Um, and the way we know that is because for, for uh, as long as the program was in existence, uh, there was a, a preservation orchard committee that each year would submit a report to the board of trustees um, talking about that past year's efforts. Um, so here you can see the report from 2010. It says in March and early April, 679 scions were distributed from 111 of the uh, Davenport collection of heirloom apples. Uh, there were 67 orders in total. Um, scions were mailed to 26 states. So in 2010, we mailed scion wood out to half the country. Uh, this was a very important way for us to continue to preserve this collection and to ensure that these um, varieties of apples um, were uh, distributed across a wide geographic area um, so that they could be preserved in many, many different places. Um, so if we ever got to the point where uh, we needed scion wood for our own collection, uh, we have great records. Uh, we can go back and uh, see who ordered uh, you know, particular varieties in, in, uh, in 2010 or earlier um, and potentially reach out to those folks and ask them if, if they'd be interested in sending us a, a piece of cyan wood from their collection if that were ever necessary. Um, unfortunately, by 2011, uh, we had had a, a, a pretty harmful, uh, really downright awful pathogen move in um, to the collection and, and, and start to really ravage the collection. Um, so you can see here in, by 2011, um, the, um, uh, by 2011, um, this was the report of the Preservation Orchard Committee. Um, it says here, unfortunately in 2011, no scions were distributed from the collection due to the occurrence of fire blight, Erwinia amylivora. Uh, 
um, during the 2010 growing season. Uh, and I'm just gonna read this in whole before we move on to the next slide. It says, apples, like many members of the rose family, are susceptible to this bacterial disease. The disease first manifested itself in a handful of trees in the late season section of the orchard. Uh, that refers to the fact that we had uh, early season apples, mid season apples, and late season apples. Um, and they were planted out that way so that we had a progression of bloom and a progression of fruiting uh, across, the, across the orchard. Um, over the course of the 2010 growing season, it became apparent that the disease had spread to 24 of the 238 trees. Uh, measures to control the disease, particularly pruning out infected materials began at once continued throughout the 2010 season. Um, in the spring and early summer of 2011, copper-based sprays, we'll talk about that again later, were added to the routine as well as limited pruning, careful sanitation in an effort to eradicate the blight. The fight is ongoing and will continue into 2012 and likely 2013. And then the final piece is no scions will be distributed from the orchard until the scions are deemed free of the blight. Um, and the reason for that is that fire blight is um, uh, harbored in old wood. And so distributing scion wood from a, um, an infected tree is a surefire way to, uh, to, um, to infect someone else's orchard. Uh, and that's not something that we were interested in doing. So fire blight. Um, fire blight is a bacterial pathogen, as was mentioned in that report. Um, Plant diseases fall into several different categories, uh, fungal pathogens, bacterial pathogens, uh, viruses. Um, so just like diseases that impact humans, you know, we, we all know about viruses uh, for sure. Uh, we also know that uh, we take antibiotics for bacterial diseases. Uh, and then there are certain you know, fungal ailments that might impact people as well. Um, but fire blight happens to be a bacteria. Um, it's named fire blight for a couple of different reasons. One, for the fact that uh, it leaves um, diseased tissue looking like it's been singed or burned, as you can see in this image here, but also for the fact that it moves so quickly through a tree um, or through an orchard. Fire blight, once it impacts an orchard, can move incredibly fast through the vascular system of a tree. Uh, and in fact, it has the ability to kill a tree, uh, depending on the size and overall health of the tree, uh, and how well it's, it's maintained and how quickly you can respond to, uh, to the presence of the pathogen. It could certainly kill a tree in a single season. So it's virulent, it's a terrible um, disease, and it's something that we hadn't really experienced um, to, this, to the degree uh, that we did in 2010 at Tower Hill. Um, of course, I'm using the collective we. Uh, I started as the director of horticulture at Tower Hill in 2018. Um, so this, was, this all precedes me. Uh, and I'm, I'm really talking about the work of my predecessor, uh, Joanne Vieira. Um, but uh, this was uh, something that we, the collective we of Tower Hill was really working, working on. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about fire blight. Fire blight or Erwinia amylovora is a bacterial pathogen, as I've mentioned, that impacts plants in the rose family. Uh, primarily impacts apples and pears. Um, ideal conditions for infection, uh, disease development and spread of the pathogen are rainy or humid weather with daytime temperatures from 75 to 85 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, this is really important. And in the next slide, you'll, we'll talk about the disease triangle, but I, I really wanna emphasize um, the importance of temperature to fire blight. Fire blight is endemic to the United States. Uh, it's, it's, um, it's a disease that's always been here. Uh, one of the reasons that the orchard industry tends to, uh, tended to be in more Northern states like Michigan, throughout New England, uh, up into the Pacific Northwest, um, is because our springtime temperatures uh, are quite a bit lower than 75 to 85 degrees when apples are in bloom. That's a really important thing to remember. Um, that temperature is critical for the spread of fire blight, for fire blight to become active, um, to spread from tree to tree. Without temperatures above 75 degrees, there's little chance that fire blight's gonna, gonna be a huge problem in your orchard. Um, and you'll understand why that is in a minute. In apples, fire blight typically enters through open flowers uh, or through wounded wood. Um, it's incredibly difficult to control once a tree has been infected. Uh, if you're not growing edible uh, plants uh, like apples, you could uh, treat a tree systemically with an antibiotic called streptomycin. Um, copper can be effective at, uh, at uh, treating fire blight. Um, 
uh, spray it as a foliar application, um, but timing uh, and application are, are really difficult just because of the time of year, the, the uh, speed at which fire blight moves around um, and how it moves through a tree. It's really difficult to uh, get the timing right. But there are resistant varieties uh, and resistant rootstocks are really key to controlling fire blight in an orchard. I haven't talked about rootstocks yet, but I'll get there. Um, so here's the disease triangle. This is what I mentioned before. Um, for disease to cause uh, symptoms, you really have to have uh, three key components. First of all, you have to have a susceptible host. Um, so uh, an apple tree is very susceptible to fire blight, but some apple trees are less susceptible than others. This is really a story of genetics. Um, Fire blight impacts plants in the rose family. Uh, it impacts pears and apples more than it impacts other uh, plants in the rose family. The rose family is a pretty large uh, and diverse uh, family of plants. Um, but fire blight doesn't impact things in the ericaceous family, like rhododendrons and azaleas. Uh, fire blight might land on uh, a rhododendron or an azalea, and it doesn't cause disease because uh, that plant is not susceptible to it. Um, so susceptible host is, is one of the key uh, uh, components of the disease triangle. Um, next, you have to have the presence of the pathogen. So as I mentioned before, fire blight is endemic to the United States. It's always been here as long as we've been here. Um, it's not an introduced uh, uh, disease that was brought in like say chestnut blight or say Dutch elm disease. Uh, both of those were brought over from Eurasia. Um, fire blight is a, a disease that always has been here in the United States. Um, and then you have to have an environment that's right uh, for the disease. So you've got to have all three things in order for, uh, for an, a pathogen to cause disease. Um, and in the case of fire blight, that conductive environment wasn't really present in New England up until about 20 years ago. Um, so 15 to 20 years ago, uh, the temperature in spring um, started to really rise on a pretty consistent basis. Um, we track weather data for the UMass Cooperative Extension. Um, so these are charts that I have a, uh, some familiarity with. Um, this is weather data from the year 1997 um, in the month of May. And what I want to call your attention to um, is uh, the maximum air temperature column. So in this column here, you can see that the maximum air temperature for the majority of the month of May, at least the early part of the month of May, um, had a high of about 65, 73 degrees uh, on May 12th. Um, but that was kind of an outlier. For the most part, we were in the 50s, the 40s. Um, this is a pretty typical May. Uh, for this area in New England, for Boylston, Massachusetts. This is, this is what we'd expect to see in Boylston uh, and what we might consider a, a typical spring. Um, 2010, we had a pretty atypical May. Uh, we had temperatures that were well into the 80s in the early part of the, uh, of the month. Um, temperatures well above that 75 degree threshold that I mentioned before. Um, and that five day period is really what led to uh, the spread of fire blight throughout the orchard that we saw during that year. Um, temperatures above 75 degrees, um, especially when the evening temperatures remain above 55 degrees Fahrenheit. Remember that was the other key component of temperature. Um, and you can see here the minimum air temperature on those days uh, pretty much stayed above 50, uh, you know, mostly 55, um, started to cool off by the time you got to May 6th, uh, May 5th, May 6th. But uh, this is really the story of why fire blight was such a problem. Um, and the reason that this timing is critical is because of something that I mentioned in one of the previous slides, that fire blight can move um, from tree to tree through open flowers. And in fact, that's the best way for fire blight to enter uh, a susceptible host plant is through an open flower. It's actually honeybees um, that do the work of moving this pathogen from one tree to the next. So when you think about apples, when you think about when they bloom uh, and what the temperature might be at the time that they're blooming, it made sense that our uh, late season apples were impacted in 2010 um, because uh, they were in bloom at the time when we had those really high temperatures. Uh, and that's what led to that, uh, that spread of fire blight, that, that really fast spread of fire blight throughout the orchard. Um, just going to move this so it's out of the way. Um, so let's talk about fire blight in a little more detail. Um, this is the, uh, the life cycle of this pathogen. Um, and so what you see here is that fire blight overwinters as a canker on uh, old and infected wood. 
um, uh, when the temperature and humidity is right in the spring, um, the bacteria comes to life and starts to ooze out from those cankers where it can be picked up by honeybees. Uh, that honeybee unwittingly or unknowingly carries uh, the pathogen um, to an open flower. Uh, as it's doing its important work of pollination, it's also carrying uh, that pathogen with it. And the pathogen is then, uh, those bacteria are then entering the vascular tissue um, of, the, of the tree uh, and causing disease. So you can see here in this next, next image, uh, the infected blossoms shrivel. Um, that's the first sign that you've got fire blight. Uh, that's the time to get in and really start to prune uh, out your uh, infected wood, uh, because if you don't, get it quickly enough, then it'll just spread throughout the entire uh, vascular system of the tree. Um, so you've got here in this image, shoot infections, blossom infections, and then fruit infections. This definitely has a big impact on, on, on affected fruit. Um, this cycle will repeat for as long as uh, the temperatures are right, as long as there are open flowers. Uh, and so fire blight will just continue um, to spread through, through an orchard like ours. Um, and then finally, uh, it, uh, the infection will spread into wood, wood um, a new canker will form, and that's where uh, the fire blight will, uh, will come from, from the next season, uh, for the next season. So that just gives you an understanding of how the, uh, the life cycle of fire blight works. Let's see if I can move to the next slide. Um, so in very short order, we went from a beautiful orchard, uh, one that we were quite proud of, uh, that had this historical significance, uh, preserving germplasm, distributing scion wood, uh, making sure that these uh, important and exceptional and rare and unusual uh, varieties of apples were, uh, were preserved uh, throughout the country and throughout the world, um, to an orchard that started to look a lot more like this, with um, trees that that we're still achieving our collections goals, um, but we were unable to distribute scion wood, so we, we lost that piece of, uh, of that important puzzle. And the uh, trees themselves really started to look pretty bad, um, pretty unsightly, um, and not exactly in the best of health. Uh, we had lost about a dozen varieties altogether, so that uh, collection of 119 trees was shrunk down to about 107 trees um, or varieties. Uh, so the orchard was really in need of, of uh, some restoration. Here you can see a tree that was just completely killed off by, by fire blight. Um, and we had more and more of this. Uh, as the temperature has warmed, uh, we've seen more uh, presence of fire blight throughout the collection. Um, and despite our best efforts, uh, it was really time uh, to kind of reset the clock. Uh, so in steps a guy by the name of John Bunker. Um, now John is uh, probably today's version of uh, Sterney Davenport. Uh, he's an incredible expert. Um, and I mentioned a little while ago that I started at Tower Hill in September of 2018. Uh, one of the first people I met um, outside of the small circle of staff and, and trustees was, was John Bunker. Um, John came and uh, met with me in November of 2018, um, sat me down, we had lunch at the cafe, and he said, uh, he said, I wanna help you restore your orchard. Uh, you've gotta cut all your trees down and start over again. Um, so you can imagine my shock, I'm uh, you know, two months into the, into the position, um, and I've got this apple expert telling me I need to cut down all my trees. Uh, and uh, I, you know, after I got over my initial shock and talked to him a little bit more, uh, I really understood what he was, what he was trying to do. Um, our orchard was grafted onto uh, rootstocks that were susceptible to fire blight. Um, and uh, in addition to that, um, semi-dwarfing apple trees, which are the uh, type that we had, um, or that we've had, um, have a life expectancy of about 30 years. So about every 30 years, you've got to start again. Uh, and that's the beauty of grafting. You can do that. Um, now, if, if we're if we're planning for doing that, we might do it over the course of say five or six years. That way we're not cutting down the entire orchard all in one fell swoop. Um, but the orchard had gotten to a point where it really didn't make a ton of sense to try to do this piecemeal. It really made a lot more sense to, uh, to do it all, all at once. Uh, rip the Band-Aid off, um, grow all new trees on uh, fire blight resistant rootstocks and start from scratch. And that's what John was advocating for. Now, John's expertise, he started a company called Fedco Trees, 
It's up in Maine, uh, and they grow um, uh, a lot of edible plants. Um, um, their uh, division of Fedco seeds, uh, you can buy all sorts of, uh, of great trees, shrubs, uh, uh, fruits, um, uh, native plants from Fedco. Um, John, uh, John started Fedco Trees, uh, but also started a, a, an heirloom orchard CSA called Out on a Limb. That was the first image that I showed you. Um, and his uh, CSA includes about 300 varieties of apples. So our, our collection of 119 varieties um, is about half, actually a little bit less than half uh, of the size of his collection. Um, so he has a, a real expertise, uh, a lot of knowledge and know-how, uh, and a great network of people to consult with. Um, on this project. So let's talk a little bit more about apple propagation. Uh, I'm sure most of you or many of you are, are familiar with um, uh, the notion of grafting. We're going to watch a short video that shows how grafting happens with apples. Um, apples are, are really interesting. Um, they can be grafted onto different rootstocks. Um, so a, a, a graft is simply, it's kind of a Frankenstein. Uh, you take one tree, um, you cut off the top of it, uh, and then you take another tree, you cut off a twig, and you uh, attach the two together. Uh, and now you've got a tree that's got uh, characteristics of, uh, of, of both um, the rootstock and the scion wood. Um, and in the case of apples, um, the, you can do a lot of things with the rootstock. You can impart disease resistance, which is what we're really after, um, but you can also impart um, uh, uh, hardiness drought resistance, uh, just general disease resistance, vigor, uh, and also size. So here's an example of different types of uh, rootstocks. So you've got uh, true dwarf rootstocks, um, semi-dwarfing rootstocks, uh, traditional rootstocks, uh, or conventional rootstocks. Um, and what's, what's unique about apples, uh, like a lot of other, uh, or unlike a lot of other plants, is that because they don't come true to seed, uh, we can't preserve their germplasm in uh, something like the uh, global seed vault. Um, so I'm sure you're familiar with the global seed vault. It's literally a bunker for storing the world's food plants uh, underground um, so that if uh, we ever lose a food crop, we've got not only um, seed for that crop, but also uh, seed from its uh, what we call crop wild relatives. Um, so we're preserving that germplasm for future generations. And this is something that we simply can't do with apples. Um, we have our own seed bank in New England uh, that's held by the Native Plant Trust that's headquartered at Garden in the Woods. Um, the effort, uh, the, the seed bank that they hold is for preserving uh, wild plant species. So not edible plant species, but wild plants, uh, rare and endangered threatened plants from across the region. Um, and so seed banking is a very common uh, practice among conservationists, um, but it's not something you can do with apples because they don't come true to seed. If you preserve seed from a fruit of an apple, it, uh, you're not going to be able to grow uh, that particular variety from the seed that comes out of that fruit. And so you have to do it in a different way. You've got to do it through grafting. Um, so here's uh, John and his wife, Cammie. Um, they came and visited the orchard in March of 2019, and they collected scion wood from each tree in the collection. Uh, so the overall idea is that uh, they would collect scion wood from every one of our trees, uh, hope to get about 10 pieces of scion wood altogether, and grow new trees um, from that scion wood. Uh, grafted onto fire blight resistant rootstocks. Um, and then in two years time or so, uh, they, uh, Fedco trees would, uh, would sell us back uh, the trees that they've been growing um, and also sell us additional trees that we could then distribute to other people if we'd like. Uh, um, there's a lot of um, breeding work that's happened uh, over many, many generations uh, with apple rootstocks. Um, but there's a very active breeding program happening at the uh, Geneva uh, Research Center um, in uh, Geneva, New York. Um, they're looking at uh, uh, developing different rootstocks for apple trees for um, things like fire blight specifically. Um, so you can see this uh, geneticist there at Geneva uh, is breeding specifically for apple rootstocks that are resistant to various diseases that might impact them. Um, and so what we decided to do with our apple orchard uh, was to graft our trees onto two different rootstocks. Um, one is a, a tried and true sort of old um, uh, rootstock that's got a, a 
fairly substantial or has a substantial track record um, for fire blight resistance, also for cold hardiness, for drought resistance, uh, just a really good rootstock, um, but one that was selected because we know how it performs in this area. Uh, and then one, and that's M111, you can see. Um, and then the other uh, rootstock that we selected was a Geneva rootstock that ha has less of a track record, um, but some really great research behind it to show that it's uh, fire blight resistant. Um, and that's the G890 rootstock. Um, something else that we did was we grafted about 20 uh, um, pieces of cyan wood, some of the rarest uh, components of the collection, onto standard rootstocks. Uh, in this case, we chose a Russian rootstock called Antonovka. Um, and the standard rootstocks will allow trees to get up uh, 40, 50 feet tall. Um, and what we're hoping to do with those uh, 20 or so trees is line them along the driveway. Um, the, the nice thing about standard rootstocks is they can survive for maybe 150 years. Uh, they're really long lived trees. They get quite large, um, but they can survive for a very long time. Um, and so that's appealing to us to have, you know, this uh, even the next time we have to make a, a restoration like this, uh, we'll have these standard apple trees kind of representing that collection, lining the driveway uh, up to the top of Tower Hill Road uh, or uh, Fuller Drive. Um, for everyone to see, even uh, as the rest of the orchard is undergoing a restoration, say in 30 years time. Um, so overall, the timeline, as I mentioned before, John um, from Fedco Trees took scion wood off of every tree in the collection um, in, uh, in the late winter, early spring of 2019. Uh, they were grafted a short time later onto these three different rootstocks. Uh, they've been growing there at Fedco Trees now for uh, a single season. They're entering their second season now. Um, we removed every single one of the trees in the collection um, in 2019 in preparing for this restoration effort. We'd like for the, uh, for the area that um, had been the orchard um, to remain fallow for at least a single season. And so it's going to remain fallow for this year. Uh, and then the, uh, the plan is that we'll be um, planting in spring of 2021. Um, so that's the overall timeline. We're really excited about the prospect of having all these new trees, um, but also really sad to see all the old trees go. Uh, and we wanted to have a way to sort of celebrate uh, and preserve and hang on to a couple of pieces of, of the old orchard. Um, so I reached out to a, a local wood carver. Um, this is uh, Reed Gilmore um, and his wife Beth, and and he run a, a wood carving or a wood turning outfit called Moon Hill Wood Art um, in Upton, Mass, um, just down the street from from us. Uh, and they created um, a whole bunch of different, uh, really beautiful products out of the apple wood from some of the uh, trees that we cut down. Um, you can see in the foreground there that's a, a natural edge bowl. Uh, there's a small bud vase, there's some pepper mills, um, ice cream scoops, pens, uh, and some really nice um, larger bowls that have a more traditional edge. So this is kind of a nice way that we can preserve um, so the, that, you know, that link with this, uh, this orchard, this beautiful orchard that's undergoing this restoration. Um, and so we're, we're very excited to have that, uh, that material. Uh, Reed and his wife are, are really, really artists. Um, and I, I know that the gift shop has um, some, of the, uh, some of this wood in the, uh, it, uh, available for sale. So if you're ever interested in taking home a piece of our preservation orchard, um, that's definitely a, a good way to do it. You can certainly buy an ice cream scoop or a wine stopper uh, or, or uh, something else like a pepper mill um, from the gift shop there. Um, Tower Hill completed an update to its master plan back in 2016. And what I wanted to point out was um, Despite the uh, the effort to expand the garden um, and to grow different components of the garden, uh, one thing that was really preserved was this apple orchard that you can see here in the middle of the, the image that I'm showing now. Um, and in fact, the idea was to expand the orchard um, to feature not just the heirloom apple trees, but also uh, potentially pears and other fruit trees, peaches, uh, and maybe some of the modern day varieties that we grow. Um, and so we're really 
really looking forward to um, uh, you know, restoring this orchard and then adding to it and enhancing it over the years um, because it's such an important piece of, uh, of who we are as an organization uh, and uh, the work that we do to conserve and preserve, uh, to preserve uh, uh, plant material. Um, so we're really hoping that you know, by 2024, uh, we'll be looking at an apple orchard that looks, uh, looks uh, just like this one um, from, from just a few years ago. Um, so I was very excited to share this presentation with you. Um, and the one piece that I um, uh, kind of missed was the video that I mentioned a couple of times. Um, I, I, I uh, had a little technical difficulty with it there. So I want to show this video. Uh, once the video is over, uh, we'll have a few minutes for questions and I'm happy to uh, unmute everyone and answer any questions that you might have. Um, so let's watch this video uh, that talks all about how um, uh, apples are grafted. I, th I think it's a really helpful tool for those of you that aren't familiar with this. Um, so bear with me for one second here as I get this going. This is one of a series of videos from the People's Trust for Endangered Species on practical orchard skills. In this one, we deal with how to graft fruit trees using the whip and tongue method. I'm going to show you how to bench graft, which is how you propagate a new fruit tree using cyan material and rootstock. We normally do this in the late winter or early spring, and to do this you're going to need a sharp knife, some clean sharp secateurs, some grafting tape, this is polythene based, a little bit like freezer bags. Um, you can actually use chopped up freezer bags if you don't have any grafting tape. Um, some grafting wax, melting over a candle here. Some dormant scion material. Now either collect this from a tree of a known variety that you want to propagate, or from a favorite tree in your orchard or back garden. Uh, and some rootstocks. We're going to graft the scion material to the rootstocks using the whip and tongue method. To do the whip and tongue grafts, you want to make a slanting cut through your scion material and a matching slanting cut through your rootstock, both with tongue cuts in them as well. The idea is that you interlock the tongue cuts, which will hold the graft fast and maximise the amount of cambial contact that you get. The cambium layer is the layer just below the bark, between the bark and the wood, and this is the layer of active growth. So it's really, really important to match up the cambium layer of your scion material and your rootstock because this is what will heal the graft and create the union. Firstly, trim the base of your cyan wood as this bit will have dried out. Then make a slanting cut at the base end of your cyan right the way through. Try to do this in one cut as that gives a clean, flat cut surface. Don't worry if you don't get the cut right first time, it's absolutely fine to do it again. Then carefully cut in a tongue. This cut can be quite tricky, so make sure you lock your thumbs in case the knife slips and instead of putting too much pressure on the knife, wiggle or rock the knife through. Make a similar slanting cut on your rootstock and then check that it matches the one on the cyanwood. You can make adjustments to this cut to make sure you get a good fit. When you're happy that the two cut surfaces match up, you can put in a tongue cut like you did with the cyanwood. It's best to use cyanwood that's the same diameter as the rootstock, but this isn't always possible. If they vary in size, then you can modify your cuts and your graft accordingly. Here, the rootstock is larger than the cyan material, so the cut to the rootstock doesn't go all the way through, but instead is slightly to the side. This means that we can create a cut that mirrors the one on the cyan material. This is called a modified whip and tongue graft. Next, we need to bind the graft that we've made with grafting tape. Um, this both keeps the cambium layers pulled together and stops the graft losing any moisture. Then we need to seal any other cut surfaces that we've made with grafting wax, um, pot it and label it. It can take a couple of weeks or months for the graft to heal, but once the top bud has grown an inch or so, you can be happy that the graft is taken. Don't worry if you get any failed grafts. If you plant out the rootstock, they should survive. 
This means you can bud graft to them in the summer or give another go bench grafting next winter or spring. So this is our new tree, labelled with the variety so that we don't forget what it is. Keep it in a pot for at least a year before planting it out. Um, if you keep it in a pot any longer than that, it's definitely worth potting it up. For more information about grafting and other instructional guides, see the website at www.ptes.org forward slash orchards. Hopefully you enjoyed that video. Um, now I'm going to stop sharing my screen um, and I'm going to tr attempt to mute or unmute all of you um, and allow you to ask any questions that you might have. Um, so thanks for sticking with me. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, uh, if you uh, have a question, please feel free to just shout it out or um, you can try to use the raise hand um, feature if you know how to do that. And it looks like we also have um, uh, uh, something from Emma, which I forgot to mention earlier, is that we are recording this. Um, so uh, just keep that in mind. And if, um, if you have questions that I'm not able to answer or if you want to look back at the presentation a little bit later, um, this has been recorded and we'll post it through our uh, website and social media and everything later on so you'll be able to access it at, a, at another time. Um, so, any questions? Mark, how different is it um, when you do air layering, wouldn't that work grafting also? Yeah, so air, air layering is another method for uh, propagation uh, where you basically scar the outside of the, uh, of the uh, trunk um, wrap maybe sphagnum around it, uh, a material that's going to hold that moisture in like a, a, a plastic of some type. Um, and what you do with air, it's a, it's a great way to um, uh, propagate something that doesn't root very well. Um, but it's pretty complicated and it's kind of difficult uh, and it's slow. Uh, and grafting is really quick. Uh, it works very well uh, as long as you know what you're doing. Um, and it's just a, a lot a lot uh, easier than air layering would be, uh, but it would allow you to grow um, uh, 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 one of these cyan woods on its own root. Um, and so in that case, you, you're, you're, you're not gonna be able to impart those uh, important characteristics that I mentioned before, like disease resistance or drought resistance or um, size. Uh, you're, you're sort of left to whatever the genetics of that cyan wood are. Um, and so it's, it's not a favored method. Uh, I don't know anyone that's air layered uh, an apple tree, um, but it, it's certain, probably feasible and possible to do that. Um, it's just, uh, it's, it's, it's not something that's typically done with apples. I gotcha. But good question. Any other questions? Were you able to track down um, the majority of the varietals that you had before? Yeah, so um, we were. So we have, we'll, when we uh, replant the orchard, we'll have all 119 varieties. So John was able to track down the 12 varieties that we were missing. Um, we did have that repository of uh, data on where cyan wood had been distributed. So if we ever needed to, we could tap into that network um, and potentially find, uh, find that cyan wood elsewhere. Um, but luckily we were able to find all 12 of those missing varieties um, through uh, Fedco trees. Um, and you know, what's, uh, what you have to keep in mind with, um, with something like apple trees is that um, you're essentially creating clones. Um, so every tree is a clone of the next one, as long as it's the same variety. So whether, um, you know, that cyan wood came from uh, a tree that originated at, at Tower Hill and was part of our cyan distribution program uh, or originated elsewhere. Um, at some point, it originated from a single tree. Uh, and so it's the same exact genetics. It's the same exact variety, whether it came from a tree that we had a hand in, uh, in 
um, scion wood for or someone else. Um, so we're, we're, we have the same varieties, uh, even if they came from a different spot. I, I hope that makes sense. It's a little, little complicated and difficult to understand sometimes, but I hope that made sense. But we were able to track down all 12. Mark, how many are left at um, Sturbridge Village? You know, I, I actually talked with the uh, horticulture manager at Old Sturbridge Village the other day, um, and I think they have somewhere around 60 or 70 varieties altogether, um, so not quite the 119. They're also very interested in um, doing some work to restore their orchard. They, they actually started uh, collecting scion wood and grafting um, themselves. Um, and we talked about uh, potentially doing a uh, joint label um, so that we could uh, share uh, with visitors to either Tower Hill or Old Sturbridge Village um, that this is indeed one collection um, and just sort of, uh, you know, reinforce that, that notion um, that this is a collection that's been around for a long time. It's had a, a, a rich history, uh, but it really all started with Mr. Davenport. Um, so we talked about doing something to sort of interpret that, uh, that connection between the two organizations, but they, I think they have about 60 or 70 varieties left there. Excellent. Yeah. All right. Mark, uh, what is it about yeah. the apple that makes it not come true from seed? And are there other food crops that have this same kind of specific challenge? Yeah, so lots of lots of food crops, lots of lots of plants don't come true from seed um, because of cross pollination. Um, so a good example, the the azalea that you can see behind me is a a, a Korean azalea called Cornell Pink. Um, and if you were to grow a seed from uh, fruit that developed on uh, on this this shrub, um, the resulting uh, progeny would have flowers that look slightly different from that Cornell pink uh, because uh, of cross-pollination. So you've got pollen coming from uh, one plant um, being moved by a pollinator to another plant. Uh, and so you're, you know, basically taking the genetics from both of those plants and splicing them together to create uh, a seed. And so most plants don't really come true to seed. Um, and it's why we have to go to such efforts to propagate things asexually. Uh, so the Cornell pink behind me, that azalea, uh, that was uh, um, stuck as a cutting in a nursery. Um, rhododendrons and azaleas are, are pretty easy to root. Um, so it's very easy to just take a, a piece off of that uh, existing shrub, stick it in some, some media with a little bit of rooting hormone um, and grow a new plant that's identical uh, to the one behind you. Um, and the reason you do that is to preserve whatever that germplasm is, uh, whether it's an ornamental characteristic like the flower color, uh, the abundance of flowers that you see on that particular shrub, or in the case of apples, uh, that unique variety that has that flavor profile, the size of fruit, um, the color, whatever it is that you're trying to preserve. Um, but I would, I would say that most plants really don't come true to seed because of cross-pollination. Um, so you, you find more examples of, uh, uh, of plants that don't come true to seed than you do of plants that do come true to seed. So maybe one more question and then we'll wrap it up. And if there isn't one, that's fine too. All right. Well, this has been great. Thank you all for sticking with me. I know it's, uh, it's you know, the end of the day and I appreciate you sticking around. Um, as I mentioned before, this will be posted to our website. So you'll be able to uh, listen to it again and uh, see the slides again, if you'd like, uh, share it with friends if you enjoyed it. Uh, and I will be doing another one. We haven't set a date for that one yet, um, but I will be doing another we webinar on native plants for New England gardens. So uh, be on the lookout on our social media channels for that as well. Um, thank you all for, for listening in and hope to see you out in the garden sometime when this whole thing blows over. So long. Thanks, Mike. Thank you very much.